All right. Well, I'm pretty sure this is going to work uh, once we get to the main reel. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us for the... Um, it's been an incredibly long delay when I do speak. See? Oh, yeah. You're, are you... Greg might be coming through on... Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. You're on the YouTube. It looks, sounds like you're on the YouTube stream. So, um, uh, hi, everybody. My name is David Gregg, and I'm the director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. Welcome to the fifth Rhode Island Nature Video Festival. Uh, with me is the video festival founder, Greg Garrett, and he is um, going to say a few words in just a second. Uh, in the meantime, if you're new here to the Natural History Survey uh, YouTube channel, um, after the video fest, take a look around, see what kind of shenanigans we've gotten up to. And uh, if you're not a subscriber, um, subscribe and hit the like button. Uh, and you'll get to hear uh, news of whatever else we're going to do. I've got a whole bunch of videos in the can from this summer that uh, I'll be putting out. And um, that should be kind of cool. Um, and the, um, the Natural History Survey, if you're not familiar with the survey itself, is a membership nonprofit. We're founded in 1994, and we're, uh, we have a mission to promote curiosity and study of the natural world and uh, public engagement with science for conservation and, um, and management. The uh, I think that the Nature Video Festival has been a great opportunity to a great way to encourage people to get out there and look at stuff they might not other look otherwise look at and to share. Sharing is um, as important as observing in the first place. So uh, I'm going to hand this off to Greg. Hopefully he will get this message, perhaps with a short delay, and uh, I'll say, Greg, it's your turn to say something. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Greg Garrett. I am, um, I guess, the founder of this illustrious event. I've been a video maker for about 10 years. Um, I have a YouTube channel called Mashasic Critters based on the Mashasic River. And I wanted to see what everybody else was doing for video. And the Environment, and the Environment Council is um, an organization that um, is an organization that um, is affiliated with the National Wildlife Federation. So it was really important to me to be able to, as I worked for the Environment Council, to connect with wildlife because the Environment Council mostly does policy work around climate, energy, um, conservation, um, environmental justice. It's an organization also with members, a lot of organizational members, individual members, um, focused very much on the state house, but we do a lot of other environmental work, and this is part of that. So, um, you know, it looked like there was about 300 people registered. I don't know how many of us are here today, but I'm looking forward to a really good show. Um, there's 17 videos by 17 vi different video makers. They're all kinds from, you know, eagles flying by to whales to lichen. It's going to be a great show. And, um, you know, at the end of the show, you get to vote for, um, you know, we'll put up all the videos on, online and you get to vote for your favorites. And we'll give out some People's Choice Awards. And um, when you got the, the, the link today, you got a donate button. If you haven't donated, um, we encourage it. It helps us to put this show on each year. And now I'm going to turn it back to David and um, let's have a show. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, the, um, just a few more details. 
The running time of the main reel of this is about an hour and 13 minutes. Uh, once this is done, uh, YouTube is recording this whole live stream. Um, so it will, should be available as soon as they've finished processing it. Um, once uh, we have a chance to go back and edit out all the technical issues in the beginning. We'll do that and we'll be able to put uh, just the main reel up on the YouTube channel so people can look at that. Um, again, to reiterate what Greg said, just remind you that um, we do have a People's Choice Award. It was funded by a generous, uh, generous donor, a member of the Natural History Survey. So there are cash prizes for people who um, win the People's Choice Awards. So um, I, I, we are not using a Dominion voting uh, machine here, so you don't have to worry about um, anything like that. What you do is you go, uh, you follow the link that you're going to get um, to a Google form. You enter your choices for the People's Choice Awards there, and they're tabulated by huh, a nefarious character, uh, Dr. Peter August, who's helping to organize the, uh, the voting part of this. Um, and he's, he, his, he is um, uh, uh, a very uh, well-respected uh, and um, highly thought of an environmentalist and scientist. And you can count on him to um, bring the, the people's choice to the fore. So um, just a, if we have technical glitches, just bear with us. Um, takes a little while for the delay on YouTube to get all the way through to us so that we to, to hear that things aren't working correctly. Um, so bear with us if we have technical glitches. I think this should work out. Again, the running time for this reel is about an hour and 13 minutes. We will get it up um, as a standalone on the YouTube channel um, fairly soon. So um, without further ado, I am going to switch it over to the main reel and um, let's see what happens. My wife and I remained housebound for 2021, with online communications for work continuing as the new normal. We spent our surrogate morning commute time watching the behavior of the backyard birds, who became significantly more familiar as a result. Many birds access seeds underneath any heaps of snow that accumulate on them. We spent a lot of time attuning to the various songs and calls the chickadees make, and heard Carolina wrens nearly as often. The chickadees were highly visible all year long, with adorable behaviors we look forward to more and more often. They have become fearless in being within two feet of us throughout the backyard. The cardinals were just as present throughout the year, but more often than not, avoid other birds. We watch them eat sparingly but often. They seem to enjoy our backyard beyond the satisfaction of a food source. We provide some video when other birds did not keep the cardinals from eating. They rarely sit still among the many resident finches that come to the feeders in bunches. They are usually seen flitting in and out to eat a seed or two at a time. We became more and more enamored with the female cardinals and noticed that they preceded the males in coming to feed. We figured we had two resident couples in 2021, which has become typical over time. At one point, when we first started feeding the birds over 10 years ago, there were seven females and two males who hung around for a full winter season. In the birdhouse, a pair of house finch were successful in birthing three healthy birds. We spent time during 2021 reading more about goldfinches, as we had finally attracted dozens of them throughout the year. They vary quite a bit in color depending on the season, and this fellow was as yellow as they got. We now recognize the northerners who stay with us during winter and the southerners who stay with us during summer. The migrators overlapped in time this year for a stint in the autumn. We counted as many as 12 morning doves in the backyard at one time in autumn. No matter how many, they all get along peacefully, which is a dramatic difference from the pigeon flocks that come occasionally with their pecking orders during summer. We are smitten by their loyalty. Our fence tops take a beating between the squirrels that use them as highways and the birds that use them as perches. The calmest of the birds are the smaller woodpeckers that come daily, typically for 20 or 30 extended stays, pecking at bark or at safflower seed offerings, 
They never seem to mind the finches and sparrows that feed in bunches with them. Year four of attracting Orioles brought a bonanza of activity. The same male arrived on the May 3rd for the third consecutive year. He fattens up quickly, and then a female arrives two or three days later. Another couple arrived within a week. They took turns at the feeder, democratically, with the males speaking with each other. The two couples produced at least seven babies that we could identify. We hadn't noticed any babies in previous years, but we admit we didn't know what we were looking for. This year, we couldn't have avoided seeing them as they were rent relentless in feeding. Often, the mother or father could be seen watching from above in the plum tree. The fathers offered vocal instructions or encouragement. The mothers were more apt to flit about energetically to supervise. The young ones seemed to struggle in negotiating social feeding norms. There was a lot of wasted flying and impatient waiting, but eventually a rhythm evolved that seemed as efficient and thoughtful as the rhythms the adults feed by. Late in the season, the oral feeder started attracting huge numbers of bees and wasps. 2020 had been very different when our only issue was with ants, which are easier to mitigate. The male orioles seemed to get vocally agitated by the bees. The others zigged, zagged, and dodged insects to eat inefficiently. We worried they would not get enough to eat before their long migration. They soon left and we experienced the greatest postpartum blues yet. Even one squirrel got in the act. Our attention diverts to other species at the bird baths while we wait for the juncos to arrive in November. The sparrows get more aggressive as do the starlings. It's a fascinating late afternoon when the starlings are in sight before heading off for their evening murmuration. Only the woodpeckers put up with it to feed at that time. We notice other flying critters throughout the year, but the staple species in this video allow us to gain confidence in anticipating behavior. And of course, we know the true expert is likely our cat, Sapphire. She logs the most observation time for within the glass.
got it. Look. He got it. Three immature eagles hanging out along the Seekonk River. One of them, this one, usually hangs out by itself, occasionally meeting up with the others. And then there are two that are, are, that are almost always together, and they're probably siblings. I showed the crow mostly to just show how much bigger than a crow, and a crow is a pretty big bird, much bigger than the crow the eagle is. Um, after this, I zoomed out, and you're going to see this in a second, and a great blue heron flew by. I zoomed out because it looked like the, e the heron would fly right where you could get a picture of both the heron and the eagle together. And then I'm going to show it to you in slow motion because you saw how fast it was. After this, this eagle flew north and hooked up with the other two eagles. And eventually, after we see the, the heron in slow motion, I'm going to show you a picture of this eagle again flying across the sky on the western on the eastern shore of the Seekonk River. Enjoy.
size of that model. Oh. It looks pretty good size. That looks like a good beaver size. <laughs> Hey, it's Kim Gaffett, the OVF naturalist with the Nature Conservancy here on Black Island, and it is fall migration time. And here we have a couple of beautiful golden crown kinglets. These are just coming down from the north where they bred this, this summer up in uh, north, uh, southern Canada. And now they're coming down our way, and they'll, they'll be here for the winter, and they'll even go as far as us. Uh, 
the Carolinas and into um, Florida, but they like they like it that uh, cool. So this is a female. You can tell because its golden crown is all yellow, and its partner here is the male, and it's a golden crown with orange in there. So friends. Little male, female, male, golden crown kinglets, ready to go.
The Saugatucket is an eight-mile stretch of river in southern Rhode Island. It is an urban river flowing through two towns and several villages, but it contains a diverse ecosystem. Some of its inhabitants are herring. River and blueback herring are migratory fish that spend much of their adult life in the ocean, then swim up the rivers to spawn in the shelter of ponds and lakes. Today we are going to explore the journey that they take from the ocean, up the salt ponds, and into the Saugatucket, where they arrive at their destination, the freshwater ponds. The herring's journey up the Saugatucket starts at the entrance of Point Judith Pond. They swim past Matunic and Galilee to the mouth of the Saugatucket River. This lower portion of the river is brackish, and a short distance away from the first dam, the herring will have to travel past. Dams pose an obvious barrier for fish trying to travel up the river, but in recent years, people have employed a solution. Fish ladders allow the fish to climb up a series of small pools so that they can pass the dam. Here we can see the herring congregating at the entrance of this first ladder. Having overcome this obstacle, the fish then swim up a wide, slow-moving stretch of the river that flows through Wakefield, until they reach the Peacedale Mill. Here they navigate the rocky tunnel that was built along with the mill to direct the flow of water. Eventually, they reach the second fish ladder. This fish ladder is not very efficient, and during the peak migratory season, the fish sometimes need help to get over the dam. Once having passed this, the herring swim through Saugatucket Pond. They pass the Rose Hill transfer site and the convergence of the Saugatucket and Mitchell Brook, the stream that flows through this super fun site. The herring then take a turn off the Saugatucket into Fresh Meadow Brook, a creek that is often barely deep enough to contain them. But they are able to overcome, and they scale the final fish ladder to reach their destination, the Haven of Indian Lake. It is perhaps the most treasured jewel along Rhode Island's magnificent coastline. Nestled near the mouth of the historic Narragansett Bay and just west of the famous Point Judith Lighthouse lies Point Judith Salt Pond. Native Americans were among the first to call the pond home. Early colonial farms and small summer fishing camps dotted the shoreline of what is now Harbor Island. Over time, these modest settlements have given way to major residential housing developments. The pond stretches four miles along a perpendicular axis to the coast. It measures about a mile wide and covers over 1,500 acres. With an average depth of only six feet, this can be treacherous for novice and visiting boaters. Point Judith Salt Pond is the second largest and perhaps the most diverse and intensively inhabited of all the South County salt ponds stretching from Narragansett to Westerly.
At the mouth of the Saugatucket, fresh and salt water mix. The embayment recesses in the coastline, forming a shallow body of water and marshes that protect the habitat and marine life from the full energy of the ocean. Although the river is one of our greatest assets, it is also a major liability. The river collects stormwater runoff from roadways and lawns. Contaminants easily infiltrate the pristine waters, while fertilizers from lawns cause algae blooms that deprive oxygen, slowly suffocating life in the water. Point Judith boasts a contrasting diversity of scenery. From bustling marina complexes to the undisturbed countryside, undeveloped small islands, and on down to a working commercial fishing port. The pond is many things to many people. It provides a source of work for many, a vacation paradise to visitors, while to others, it is a peaceful sanctuary they call home. In fact, over the years, seasonal beach cottages have turned into beautiful year-round modern houses. A barrier beach separates the pond from the sea and was once connected by a natural breachway for most of its history. Since the early 20th century, a man-made breachway with rock jetties at the Port of Galilee allows the pond to flush twice daily with the tides. very limited tidal flushing in the northern section of the pond. Because of the mixing of fresh water from the river to the north and the salt water from the ocean to the south, the upper pond often has a two-layered flow of water. Eutrophication is more common in the northern geography because of the limited flushing and proximity to concentrated pollutant sources. The causeway onto Harbor Island is vulnerable to flooding. In fact, most recently, this was listed in the town of Narragansett's hazard mitigation plan. Recent storm surges from hurricanes have on occasion stranded hundreds of people living on the island. The town just completed a study looking at ways to raise the low-lying road while introducing a potential culvert to enable Long Cove to flush with the tide. Salt Pond is a source of constant beauty year-round. In the spring, the chirping of migratory birds fills the cool morning air while boats emerge on private docks. The smell of fresh-cut grass and spring flowers perfume the neighborhoods while sun-deprived locals eagerly begin their afternoon walks and bike rides. By summer, the pond is bustling with anglers, boaters, cohoggers, swimmers, and animals. Indeed, Point Judith Pond is a very special place, a hidden gem, a canvas for colorful sunsets that melt into the tiny coves filled with schoolies and clams.
tranquility by Leah Viamontes. It's hard to imagine a river so calm as it flows and moves right along with a bottle of water right in my hand and a cool summer breeze whipping through my hair. I admire the river for its mesmerizing view and the trees surrounding me giving off a cool vibe too. The gorgeous blue tone of the Blackstone River reminding me of why I arrived today. My family and I look out to the open and rejoice in the beautiful view of the open river before us. If I were to paint a portrait of this delicate day, I'd include the feeling of tranquility that I felt whilst taking in the sight that stood right before my glistening eyes. Nemakau, Manotas, Matukwas. I am many trees, Edward Jackson. Water ties us back to the Creator, Minitou, and Mother Earth, Father Sky, and all living two legged things. All living things. Our Blackstone River, the Nipmuc River, is the people's river. My freshwater people. My brothers and sisters surrounding us, the Narragansetts, the Wampanoags, Niantics, Pequots, Poconocus, all work together with the Nipmucks. We are one people, the original nation of Turtle Island. We stand alongside many First Nations along the waterways that we have traveled for generations. Today, Kit Tuck meaning Great Tidal River, is sick. Our fish cannot move freely upstream to their beginnings and downstream to their future. With the addition of the colonists building dams, our livelihood changed. Industry dumping toxic to the river through mills, dyes, and chemicals. We are the water protectors. She is a part of us and we are part of her. When the water is sick, so are we. Our ancestors have said, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. We need to come together. We are the water protectors of Blackstone River and all Eastern woodland rivers. Aquini Aho. Hi, I'm Zachary from Pawtucket, and this is River Island Park. Its 2.5 acres contains many fun activities to do. One of which is its large field, an eighth of a mile trap, great for any sport activity. Other fun activities include the Children's Book Spot, a great place for youth to get free books. Hi, my name is Vinicio and I'm from Central Falls. One thing I love about River Island Park is how much pride people take in the park. And they do this by cleaning up after themselves. And any trash and recycling they find ends up in bins like this provided around the park. Hey, I'm Aaliyah, I'm from Patooka, Rhode Island, and I have a question for you. Are you looking for a place where you can both enjoy the nature of Rhode Island and take in the view of the beautiful Blackstone River? Well, come visit River Island Park and Campground. The park includes a bridge that crosses over to the mesmerizing River Island and includes beautiful scenery and relaxing recreation. Not to mention, Rhode Island's only urban campground is located on the island and is available for reservation. Oftentimes, young people who live in the city do not visit green spaces because they aren't familiar with those spaces. 
not having transportation, or they have the impression that accessing green spaces is not part of their culture. This is an environmental issue because when younger generations do not have the opportunity to visit waterways, green spaces, and see wildlife, they don't have a chance to connect to the land and other living species. Their sources of water and how all these elements are all interconnected. Not having a connection to land, water, and non-human sentient beings is not only isolating to youth, it isolates them from the reasons why we should take care of Mother Earth. Slater Mill was built by English industrial Samuel Slater in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, along the Blackstone River in 1793. It was the first successful factory in American history and the first of countless cotton mills that would come to dominate Rhode Island. These mills spun raw cotton into thread using a variety of water-powered machines. It's too cold to grow cotton in New England, so all this cotton was being imported from slave plantations in the South. Rhode Island's mills then were part of the demand side of the system of slavery, buying up the cotton that was picked and processed by enslaved people, and so encouraging the spread of slavery deeper south and further west, right up into the Civil War. Enslaved people did not labor in the mills themselves, though. Rhode Island had a significant population of free and enslaved people of color, but capitalists established northern mill work as white labor, and people of color were systematically barred from employment. The mills employed exclusively young white workers aged roughly 7 to 13 who made some 40 to 60 cents per week working between 12 and 16 hours per day. Both boys and girls were employed, though even at this stage boys were paid higher wages than girls. But child workers protested from the beginning. They ran away in large numbers and parents regularly pulled their children out of the mills. Even before the first mills were running, people were protesting. When Slater was constructing the first mill dam in the early 1790s, Pawtucket residents attacked and dismantled the dam in the middle of the night to protest the changes to the Blackstone River, as well as to the coming industrial order the dam represented. By the 1820s, Pawtucket had undergone a burst of industrialization and now had eight textile mills, six machinery manufacturers, and a population of around 3,000. By this time, the mills had more complex weaving machines and had brought in young women, aged 15 to 30 year olds, to work them, as they were too complex for children. Young women quickly became those prominent workers in the mills. Mill owners continued to exploit these young women as if they were young children, though. In May of 1824, mill owners across Pawtucket met collectively and decided to cut the wages of these women workers by one-fourth and to extend the workday to all employees. They thought these young women would simply accept these cuts, but they were wrong. 102 women workers in multiple factories immediately walked off the job in protest and resolved not to return to work unless their old wages were restored. They quickly enlisted the support of other workers, as well as Pawtucket community members still upset with the power the mills had taken. This was the first factory strike in American history and the first strike of any kind in America led by women. After a week, the strike ended with a compromise. We don't know the details, but we know the workers at least won a partial restoration of their wages, a huge victory at this early point in industrialization. Here are some ways that we as a community can help protect the Blackstone River. Conserve the water you use at home like turning off the water while brushing your teeth. Installing rain barrels is an easy way to collect water when it rains, before it becomes polluted stormwater runoff that hurts our local rivers. Water retained in a rain barrel can be used to water grass or flowers, helping residents lessen their impact on the environment and save money on their water bill. Support tree planting and green space projects. Green spaces help reduce the risk of flooding by absorbing rainfall where it lands and cools down our cities. Don't litter or dump anything into sewer drains. Remember that when it rains, water from parking lots, streets, and highways flows into the rivers and ultimately ends up in the Narragansett Bay, carrying with it animal waste, oil, grease, fertilizer, and garbage. Organize a river cleanup with your school or community group. And last but not least, visit the river and enjoy it.
Well, everybody, uh, Greg is um, Greg's not logged back on now, but uh, I, I'll just say thank you to all of the attendees. There were well over 130 of you on. Thank you to the video makers for your hard work and your creativity and for showing us that anybody, you know, with one of these can do amazing things. So you've got a whole year until the next one because I'm pretty sure we'll do another. Um, so get out there and make some cool videos. Um, so thanks to Environment Council of Rhode Island, <clears throat> to the prize donors, um, uh, the um, People's Choice Award uh, votes will be open as soon as we send out the link, or if you've already got the link, to go to the Google um, form and vote for the People's Choice Award. Thank you to the prize donors. Everybody who goes and votes is going to get some really cool photos that were also donated as inducements. Um, we're going to leave the chat open for a few minutes so people can um, keep commenting. If you have questions for the video makers, a lot of them are on this call. So um, again, thanks to everybody who made this happen. It was I'm floored by the quality of the videos and the range of stuff that we got to see. And I really look forward to seeing what folks come up with for next year. So thanks again and see you out there.
Jackson of Newport has um, agreed, been a sponsor. Um, this is her third year of sponsoring. Um, we much thank Lauren. She is a real supporter of video in Rhode Island. Um, we had judges this year for the first time. Um,